Let's dive right in. For a more detailed version of this tutorial, check out the Getting Started with Geometry Nodes video linked in the description. This is a more direct demonstration. To start, we're going to make sure that we have Blender 3.0 or onwards, as we'll be using Geometry Nodes quite extensively. I'll grab my default cube, come to the Geometry Nodes workspace, and add in a new node tree, which I will name NFS for Nano Pillar Functionalized Surface. With my node tree in place, I'll disconnect the input from the output and use Shift A to add in a mesh primitive cube. Then I'm going to add in two geometry transform nodes, and I'll Shift D to duplicate this. I'll connect the relevant sockets and connect this to the output. From here, I'm going to add half the Z height in the first transform node, so 0.5 meters. Then I will connect the scale output of my second transform node into the group input, exposing it in the modifier stack. I can now use this to control the aspect ratio and make the height move relative to the bottom plane. For this specific case, we'll start with two in the X and Y and about 0.25 in the Z. What I'd like to do at this point is scatter some pillars on this top surface. And to do that, I'm going to use a mesh primitive grid. I'm going to offset this grid in the Z direction by the same value that is coming in from this scale node. So I'll hit Shift A, add in a vector, separate X, Y, Z, connect in this vector, and then use a vector combine XYZ to grab just the information from the Z socket. I'll add in another transform geometry node, connect this to the grid, and connect this vector into the translation. Now I can go ahead and add a join geometry node or simply select these two nodes and hit control number pad zero. Now, if I hit Z and come into wireframe, you can see I have a grid on top of my actual substrate or my original cube. I'm going to expose some of the parameters for this grid as well, including the X and Y size, which I will expose separately, and also the number of vertices. If I wanted to constrain this to a square, I could simply make them into the same socket. However, I would like my end users to be able to control both the dimensions separately, as well as the count. So if I wanted to, I could have, let's say, a count of 2 in X and 14 in Y. So you could use this for all different kinds of applications. For now, we'll settle on 5, and we'll go with about 1.5 for the dimensions of the grid. For those who are not aware, to select multiple things, I'm just holding down Shift and left-click dragging until I have the fields I want, entering one value, and then it shows up for both. At this point, I'd like to add some pillars to each of these points. And to do that, I'm going to use an instance on points node. So Shift A, instances, and instance on points. I'll connect this to the transform, and you can see that this has removed everything. In this specific instance, I'd actually like to use pillars, and I'm going to use the same set of nodes for the substrate for the pillars. So I'll duplicate these, move them up, and I will connect this transform into the instance. In solid view, you can see that they're a little too big, and once again, the controls are going to be afforded by this second scale node. So I'll go ahead and plug that into the group input again. Now, in the modifier tab, I can come over and I can change the aspect ratio, so I'll make these much thinner. And you can see I have my separate pillars, which I can now control the size and distribution of. So the Z height controlled through here, the number of pillars in a different direction controlled through the vertices X and vertices Y. Just to have a little bit more organization, I'll clean up the nodes and move them into frames using Control J. So to demonstrate that, I'll select all the nodes associated with creating the pillars. Just move them up by dragging, and then hit Control J to put them in a frame. I'll select the frame, hit F2, and name this Nano Pillars. You can now see that I have a little bit more organization, and likewise, I'm going to grab this bottom set, Control J, F2, and we'll call this Substrate. The key thing here is that when I move the substrate up and down, the pillars will move with it regardless of how I change it, and as I move in or out, I can then adjust the size of the grid to match whatever specification I'd like. From a technical perspective, let's assume my nano pillars are catalytic, and I want to show atoms adsorbing to their surfaces. I can easily do this with a distribute points on faces node. So I'll zoom in here to my instances on points, shift A, come to point, and distribute on faces. I'll then connect the instances to the mesh, and this is now placing points on all of these pillars. To use those points, I'll add another instance on points node, connect this into the points, and at this point, I could add a very simple mesh primitive, such as a UV sphere. Connect this into the instances, and if I wanted to, I could join that to the complete geometry down here, and you would see it appear, albeit at a little bit of a distorted scale. 
What I'd like to do in this specific instance is actually grab an object from the scene. So I don't want to use this primitive UV sphere. I'd like to use anything I have. So if you actually had a specific target molecule that you wanted to put on this surface, you could do so. So I'll go ahead, delete this node with X, and then make sure that I pin my node tree in place by selecting the object and hitting this little pin icon. That way, when I add something new, the nodes won't disappear. So Shift A in the viewport, add in a simple UV sphere, Control 2 for a little subdivision, right click, shade smooth, and I'll move that out of the way. We'll grab that sphere from the scene outliner, drag it into place, and connect the geometry socket into the instance. I can then grab this instance and connect it into the joint geometry. Again, you can see that it's quite large, but we're going to solve that problem by simply dragging down the scale value until it's a little bit more sensible. At this point, I can also control the density of the sphere. So if I wanted more, I could simply change this number from 10 to 200 to 2000. At some point, you want to be a little cautious because adding too many will slow down your scene quite substantially. One other thing worth noting is that you want to use the object that you import as an instance because that significantly reduces the amount of memory that Blender has to use to create all of these objects. If I wanted to make sure that the spheres could never intersect each other, then I can change from random to Poisson distribution, and then I have a number of extra settings, such as the minimum distance between spheres, let's say 0 0.01 to start, and then I can reset this density to, let's say, 50. Usually what you'd like to do is add to the minimum distance until it's just big enough that the spheres will never intersect each other. So we'll start with 0.05, maybe go all the way up to 0.1, and at this point, you can see that even at higher densities, none of my spheres are intersecting. And if I bring this value up, you can see they're still not going to intersect. So this is the look that I'd like to go after. I can also expose all of these parameters, such as the minimum distance between spheres, the density, and the scale of the actual placing or atom or sphere that I'm placing. And that is useful because, again, I can access all of those from the geometry nodes panel and hand this off to someone. They don't have to use the nodes. They can create the whole scene using just the selections here. And this file will be available on Gumroad for exactly that purpose. In fact, what I'd like to do is make sure that I can do that right now. So I'll go ahead, bring the group input node over, and expose all of those parameters. So I'll grab the minimum distance, the maximum density. I will also include the seed value here, because this lets me oscillate between different random selections quite quickly. I'm going to add in the object info, so I can put whatever object I want right here. I simply select sphere at this point, and I'll add in the scale as well. I will add more meaningful names to all of these at the end, so that it's much easier to use and to navigate, since right now this is a little bit nondescript. At this point, you might notice that the spheres are essentially embedded into the pillars. And what I would like is for them to be sitting just on the outside. To do that, I could do a number of different things, but very simply, I'm going to drag all of these nodes over, and after the instance on points node, I'm going to add in three different nodes. One is a scale instances, the next will be Translate, and the last will be Realize instances. Realize is necessary because it will effectively apply the scale that I'm using through here and here. Otherwise, I would distort the geometry. So if I select this and hit Mute, you can see that by scaling an X, I'm going to distort that. But as soon as I return the Realize instances, it actually just moves them in space. So we're going to do this. I'll come into a side orthographic view with 3 or 1 on my number pad. And I'll adjust the x and y scale values until the spheres are just touching the edge. So you can see just about there, they're touching the edge. And that should be the same in y, so if we switch to the other direction, you can see, once again, just touching the edge. If you have an issue with these sitting at the bottom, you can use the z offset from the translate to shift everything up onto that surface. So we'll go a little bit more precise there to 0.45. That's much too high, 0.045, sorry and that should be much better. You may notice that some of these are intersecting at the bottom. That is because there are actually spheres being placed on the bottom face. I'm also going to expose all of these values so that they can be controlled by the user. So I'll grab the scale here, which I will relabel to offset or something similar, and I'll grab the translation vector as well. Now I can come in and fine tune some of this. So for instance, I know that this scale is currently the size of my atoms. So I'd like to bring that down to about half of its current value. And then I'm going to come in once again and clean this up on the side, and we'll come back. So just drag this value in slightly while holding Shift. And X and Y should be about the same, and we'll bring the translate down until it's just sitting on the surface. That's pretty much perfect. I'll go ahead and relabel all of this node group, and then when we come back, we'll apply a few extra modifiers, add materials, and we'll wrap up from there.
Very simply, before I start this, to add or label, you can simply select your group input, hit N, come to the group, and then you could adjust all of the names as well as add tooltips that will scroll over for people who are looking at this later down the road. You can see I've now relabeled the entire node network, so it's much more usable for someone who would be looking at this firsthand. I'd also like to add a few modifiers, namely a bevel modifier for the base and possibly also the pillars, and then I'd like to add materials. So I'll go ahead, collapse the geometry nodes for now, and add a bevel modifier. You'll notice right away that it only applies to the base. So I can go ahead, bring this value down, bring the counts up. And if I want this to apply to the pillars as well, I have to remember that the pillars are currently instanced objects, and modifiers in the stack further down will not apply to those. So if I want the bevel to appear on the pillars, then I have to use another Realize Instances node. This will create more geometry in the scene and slow things down a bit, but it can be useful to add subsequent modifiers if you like. The other thing you might notice is if I try and right click and shade smooth, nothing happens. And that's because I actually have to set shade smooth in the node network. So I can go ahead, shift A, come to mesh, set shade smooth. And in this case, I would like everything to be smooth. So I'll simply add it after the join geometry. If I only wanted one component, such as the substrate down here, or the upper component up here with just the pillars to be smooth, I would simply place it there. But in this case, we'll add it right there, and now everything has been set to shade smooth. Finally, let's add our materials. If we were to hit Z and come into render view right now, grab our sphere and apply a material to it, we would, would see that the sphere actually updates, and that's because this is an independent object. If, however, we grab our base, and we already have a material here, you can see that changing it does absolutely nothing. And that's because like Shade Smooth, we have to apply the material to the geometry nodes. And we're going to use this to separate out the different parts. So we'll go Shift A, Material, Set Material, and I'll place one here. I'll duplicate this node, set one right here. Sorry, we'll set that again. We'll set that here, or this one will be our pillars. This one will be our substrate. And we could override the material and spheres by adding one right here. And now we have control over pretty much every parameter. For my purpose, I like to add the materials into the object anyway. So we'll add in two more and we'll label these appropriately. So we'll call this substrate, pillars, and atoms. And now we can set these as we'd like. I would like my substrate to be some sort of simple glass, bring the roughness down, bring the transmission all the way up, I'd like my pillars to be metallic and probably some sort of gold, so we'll bring that to a copper yellow color, drag the roughness down to about 0.3, and for my atoms, I'd like them to be a sort of off blue that is a little bit more rough. We can now go ahead and in the materials node, select each of these options, or we could drag our group input over and expose each of these again. So this will be our substrate material, this will be our pillars material, and this will be our atoms material. And I'll relabel all of those appropriately. Coming back, you can see that I've changed the frames just a little bit to include all of the extra nodes that we added in their respective homes. And I've also got the material set up so we can now choose our different materials, substrate, pillars, and of course, atoms. And to make this a little bit nicer to look at, we'll go ahead, add in a basic ground plane with shift A, and then I'll come to the cycles render engine and you can see we've got this nice adjustable substrate. Back in the main layout window, you can see our final scene. We have a great deal of control through all of the toggles in the geometry nodes. And if we really wanted to, we could add additional criteria or build out further features. As mentioned before, I could hand this off to someone else and all the relevant controls are available in the modifier tab. So if they are content to use these controls, they would never have to look at the nodes. If you'd like to use these, I will be putting it up on my Gumrun page available for free. And with that, thanks for coming out. If you want to watch a more involved version of this video, check out the in-depth tutorial, which is also on the channel and provides much more commentary on geometry nodes themselves, the rationale behind each step, various details, showcases of other possible approaches to aspects of the scene, and provides a number of references for learning more about geometry nodes. If you'd like to support me in making more Blender content with a specific scientific focus, especially in geometry nodes, consider checking out my Patreon, which is linked in the description. Patreon helps make it possible to make these tutorials and release the assets for free, so many thanks to my existing patrons. In upcoming tutorials, I'll be using geometry nodes to make common scientific figures, including various crystal lattices, porous networks, specific cellular structures, polymers, copolymers, branch polymers, and many, many other topics.
If you have other suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments. And if you found this useful or engaging, consider subscribing, mentioning it to your friends and colleagues, and until next time, you have yourselves a great old day.